I'd like to introduce my colleagues, Olivia Helfer and Grace DiVagilio. They are coordinators, co yeah, co-coordinators of the Hospital Library Services Program here at Winnie Grace has been with the Winnie HLSP program since 1995. She did not intend to be a medical librarian, but answered a newspaper, help wanted advertisement out of curiosity. And in addition to being coordinator of the program, Olivia is liaison to the Committee for Health Information Access, CHIA, a Winnie Lurk standing committee that strives to educate people on where to find reliable health information. All right, Grace and Olivia, it's all you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, this is gonna be very informal. Um, so feel free to submit questions to the chat box. We do have a list of questions that we got ahead of time from other interested parties. Um, we're gonna give you a little bit of background about the program and... Um, feel free to interrupt yeah. at any point in time if you have want further clarification or anything. We're keeping it as informal as possible. <laughs> and again, we would love to see your faces if you don't mind at least putting on your cameras for part of the time. Okay, Olivia. So um, Grace and I work as circuit librarians in different hospitals here in Western New York. Um, I personally go to four different hospitals. And so every day I could be at a different hospital. And the hospitals that I go to are um, Sisters of Charity Hospital, and it has a campus called St. Joseph Campus. And then up in Mount St. Mary's Hospital in Lewiston, New York, and then in Niagara Falls, New York, Niagara Falls Memorial Medical Center. So those are the four hospitals that I go to. Grace, where do you go? Um, let me just preface that by saying that Winnie Lurk serves the six counties of Western New York. Um, and we're called the Three R's Council. And there are nine councils in New York State. And um, each one encompasses a different service area. So our closest area, I believe, is Rochester is the one right next door to us. But for Winnie Lark, we have um, Erie, Niagara, Genesee, Chautauqua, Cattaraugus, and Orleans. Mm -hmm. Is that six? Mm -hmm. Okay. So an interesting tidbit, um, that one of the first library, I believe she was the second librarian when this program started back in 1982. Uh, she had 26 hospitals. <laughs> I, just, I can't even wrap my head around that. Uh, but through kind of attrition and hospital closures and um, mergers, we're down to very, what looks like a skeletal list of hospitals that remain. And these are the big systems and the smaller hospitals really have no choice but to align themselves with a larger system if they wanna provide. And so these outlying hospitals, they provide an additional demographic for the um, hospital system to serve more patients, more customers, okay? So back to the hospitals that I serve, I serve uh, Mercy, which is in South Buffalo, and Kenmore Mercy, which is in Kenmore, New York, which is right outside the city limits. And I should quickly mention that um, Adrian Depp, who is our third circuit librarian, and she's on this call, she serves the Kaleida Health System. So she serves Buffalo General and Miller Filmer Suburban, and also Children's Hospital, Oshai Children's, which does not have an actual library anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's another kind of, um, I don't wanna say point of contention, but it's just the way that things happen. Libraries, you can't take them for granted. You have to fight for them. <laughs> and uh, we do what we can to make ourselves relevant and you know, helpful to those we serve. Mm -hmm. So that actually uh, brings up a really good question. We have a lot of people ask us, do all hospitals have hospital libraries? And the answer is no. Um, many of them do not for any number of reasons. Um, and as we've seen, even just in the past decade, a lot of hospitals through mergers 
will provide maybe electronic services for six hospitals, but not each hospital has its own physical library space. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of different uh, <laughs> reasoning behind that, um, but we, we try to do the best we can to provide services to hospitals that we don't physically visit all the time. And um, thankfully, because of electronic resources, we can do a lot of that, but there's some things that you just cannot replace. An in-person um, interaction with somebody, you just can't replace that sometimes. So um, it definitely, being a hospital librarian has its challenges when you're trying to drum up business in a hospital who has no idea that there's another person who's answering the request behind the email. Um, but that is predominantly how we do a lot of our requests and services is through email, through forms. People will fill out forms for things that they need um, and we will answer them. We do pride ourselves on having a pretty quick turnaround time. We want people to know that we are present and we hear their request. And so we try to get back to them as soon as possible. Um, and we think that's really important in the hospital environment where there's a uh, patient request that they may need to be answered that, that minute, that hour. Um, so we do pride ourselves on that. We're also not afraid to pick up the phone and call someone if it's going to eliminate the back and forth and trying to pin people down. Um, and sometimes people are surprised to hear from you, especially when they have over to books, uh, which is my, one of the questions was, what is your least favorite part of hospital librarianship, and that would be playing library police, yeah. <laughs> trying to get book titles back. And here's a quick funny story. There's a Seinfeld episode where somebody returns a library book like 40 years late or something, and they start calculating the fines. We actually had someone return uh, a radiology book. I think it was from 45 years ago. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it was it was kind of held departmentally and it wasn't really signed out, but we were happy to get it back and I kept it and everything because the font is really cool and everything. But um, anyway, I don't know how I got on that aside. What were we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I see quickly here in the um, chat that someone had a question about Rochester. Yeah, so so Rochester Regional Library Council. Um, is in charge of their hospital library services program, which is um, administered, I believe, by Beth Mamo at Rochester Regional. And they are completely remote right now. They don't, they're not using their actual physical space. And actually, they also took over one of our hospitals that was kind of um, on the fence. Uh, county boundary wise. So what happened was United Memorial Medical Center, which is in Batavia, New York, is in uh, Genesee County. And previous to that, it had been uh, St. Jerome's and uh, I can't even think what, oh, oh Bank Street um, Hospital, or that was the, the other campus. Anyway, they got absorbed by the Rochester Regional um, health system. So they kind of phased us out and they are now taken care of by uh, the people at Rochester Regional Health System. So that was kind of an unusual thing that's come up. That same situation also happened at WCA Hospital down in Jamestown and they are now uh, run by UPMC, which is University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. So in theory, they've got a lot of electronic resources that they have access to, but I don't know how much hands-on help they get. And that's kind of been a frustrating thing for us to deal with is that it, we really don't have much recourse except by begging <laughs> for them to, to come back in the program. So that's been like kind of another casualty of the way that things have gone and uh, libraries downsizing, uh, you know, there's, there's been a lot of changes since this, since this program started in the early 80s. I haven't been here that long, but um, I can tell you there's been a lot of changes. So, okay. 
you want to describe the HLSP like history? Not really. <laughs> well, okay. So we can just talk for, about the funding. Let's talk yeah. about funding. Um, well, I will <laughs> say just as an overview for people who are not familiar with Hospital Library Services Program, it is actually a state run. We get some funds from the state, some from funds from other places, but each each council, there's nine councils throughout New York State, and each council gets to decide how they run their program. So we actually do things a little bit differently here in Western New York in that we have a, um, it used to be called a circuit rider program, um, but we, we physically go and visit our hospitals and we, um, most of our hospitals, we physically go and visit them and we provide services to them that way. We have, there are some councils who um, basically just outsource the program. And so they give funds to um, maybe another hospital system that's more well equipped to uh, provide services to- Or the an hospital. adjacent university. Or maybe. university, yeah. Um, and, and so it's, there's a lot of flexibility in the program and the, that there's, uh, that's really good because you can use the funds in such a way to meet the needs of your community, your immediate community, and do it in a way that works for uh, the medical professionals that are in that area. Because um, New York is very diverse. I mean, we, we go from millions of people in the metro area of New York City, Manhattan, and having lots and lots of huge hospitals to very rural areas that you may have to drive an hour and a half to get to the nearest hospital. And so the needs that are um, in each of those regions is very different. Um, and so to have some funds that are specifically set aside for medical purposes, information wise is really, really important, which brings us to funding because we have um, different kind of funding as well. Some provided through the state, some provided here in Western NISP. New York. Mention NISP. Yeah, through. So we have, there's, there's state money, we call it state aid, and we get a certain amount of money based on the number of acute care facilities that are located in our six county region. Um, and that will, it's a, it's a flat, um, algorithm it's well, a it's yeah, a calculation there's, there's a formula for it we yeah. never know how much money we're going to get even if they tell us you yeah. really don't know until you get that state check right so we have that money from the state and then we also get something called MISP money MISP medical information subsidy program or services program oh, I think it is yeah. yeah and they that is specifically it's a it's a smaller pot of money and it's specifically for um even narrower things. It's supposed to be for electronic, electronic medical information. Yeah. So for ILLs, for interlibrary loans, things like that, we use a lot of that money for that or to pay for um, electronic resources. Because um, I'm sure many of you know databases are extremely expensive. Um, Ebooks are expensive. Licensing for all that stuff costs a lot of money. Um, so we use some of that money as well. And then because of the way we run our program, we also charge our hospitals uh, a participation fee um, for the hours that we spend providing them services. And we do, we contract a different number of hours with different hospitals based on what their needs are. So sometimes some hospitals were there part-time essentially. Um, other hospitals, maybe we only go and visit a couple of times a month. That's really all that they need. Um, so it just depends. And we annually will renew those contracts with our hospitals um, based on what they need and what they want for the coming year. So that's kind of the, um, the rundown of our funding. Um, Can I interject? Uh, yeah. So one of the reasons that we charge the hospitals is so that we can supplement the state aid to provide programs. But this really goes way back to um, when reporting the grant funding that you got, there were only certain categories that the state would allow. So by um, creating these agreements with the hospitals, it gives us more uh, flexibility to spend on what we wanna spend. And um, so in addition to the on and offsite services that we provide, um, we do provide grant money for print resources mostly uh, and or equipment. We have written grants in the past to get equipment 
for hospitals from say like the National Network of Library of Medicine. We are now part of Region 7, which is in Mass based in Massachusetts, but we used to be part of the, um, what was called the Pittsburgh Regional Medical Library. And they provide funding opportunities, not just for us, but for anyone. So if you're working with a public library, uh, any kind of library can apply for funding from them. And um, this is the first year with our new RML and we're still kind of establishing a relationship and getting to know them. And um, actually for some of you, you will be getting a um, survey that we're gonna be sending out to better inform the new RML or region seven um, about New York State libraries and librarians. Mary Jo asks a really good question. Are the point people for these contracts different for each hospital? Who's usually the best person to reach? Um, we actually send a paper copy of uh, a lot of information actually. Um, uh, Jen is on this call and she is helping us with that and doing a great job. Um, but the, the contract itself, we send to uh, the CEO or the president of each hospital um, to get their eyes on it, and they actually will sign off on it. Um, typically, though, we will go through multiple avenues to get that contract to the person that it needs to get to. We'll send it to the secretary or the administrative assistant. We'll send it, um, we'll have a liaison for each uh, hospital that we have. So we'll go through that liaison as well and say, okay, you know, here's, um, here's this year's contract, just so you know. And sometimes they have to walk it into the office of the president themselves. We will send it to um, the vice president of medical affairs or the chief medical officer. Um, because a lot of times uh, we might fall in their department, the library will fall in their department, or maybe an educator, a clinical educator. Uh, again, this is different for every single hospital. And so you just kind of have to um, be open to sending it to the person who's going to get the job done. Um, and it's worked for us thus far. We do have to do a little bit of needling sometimes so to be like- Speaking <laughs> of needling, what usually happens is we send out the agreements for our grant year, which runs from April 1st of one year to March 31st of the next year. And they end up unsigned in a pile of junk on someone's desk. <laughs> so it's up to, up to the secretary or administrative assistant to find that, get the- you know, CEO or whomever to sign off on it. And then um, we can send them an invoice. So, and we're very flexible as, part, as far as payment. We offer different payment programs, but they usually seem to go with what we usually do, which is a deposit and then the remainder. I wanted to mention quickly too, someone had asked about whether their taxes that they pay for New York State help to fund this program, and they absolutely do. <laughs> so you can be happy to know that, like, the, we have some doers here that are trying to help, some do gooders, I should say. <laughs> and uh, that is money well spent because we really make the, the most of every cent that we get, including, I just want to throw this in there before we forget it. MLA webinars that we sponsor and have been sponsoring, which are open to uh, anyone in the region, really. Uh, we direct them towards, we advertise them through our Winnie Libel listserv and also advertise to uh, the students, the graduate library students at UB. And um, so you can look for those announcements coming up and they are free to you to attend. That actually reminds me, I have to contact someone today. <laughs> the last minute. <laughs> okay. I have a question for you, jumping off on that um, with the education. Are there special courses in school to be a hospital librarian? Are there internships? What, what can one do to prepare to be a hospital librarian? Well, there, there was a course at UB that Diane Schwartz used to teach, and she used to be the librarian at, um, Buffalo General, um, but I don't think that course has been offered in a long time. Uh, 
you know, you can take references. There, there's really no, no way to prepare for this. Um, you know, let's just talk about how Olivia got yeah. into this, um, got her I, and foot I will, in the door. I will say, I think, cause I, I, um, I went to UB to get my master's and I was able to take that health sciences librarianship course, which if there is one, I know so many um, I schools out there, they'll have niche courses like that. So if there's something like a health sciences course, even just a, a general sciences course, um, which is what I took. Yeah. And it's so it'll it'll cover things more um, STEM uh, technology, mathematics, engineering, those sorts of things are hard sciences, but it's still really helpful because it gets you thinking along the very logical progression side um, that health sciences will also have you in. Uh, but I, I highly encourage anyone who's interested in entering into health sciences, hospital, medical, librarianship um, to do some sort of internship or practicum um, in the field. I actually did my practicum with HLSP um, and I did it over the summer, which was a great time um, for me to do it. Uh, and I just learned so much boots on the ground information that I never would have learned in a classroom. And every, every hospital, every environment is just going to be slightly different. So to be able to um, glean knowledge and learn a lot from practicing librarians. I, I worked with Grace. I worked with my, my predecessor as well. Um, Plus we have a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> I think any librarian would say that though. I think well, yeah. we come into the field because it's, it's such a, a, such a joy. It does come with its fair share of headaches at times, not going to lie, but, but there's so, so much good that comes from it. Um, and People so are very appreciative, like, crazy <laughs> appreciative. Can I jump in here and talk about how I got to be a medical librarian? Sure. I started out um, in college as pre-pharmacy, and then I got to organic chemistry, and that was the end of that. So I have a background in like biology and physics and general chemistry, and then I switched to psychology, um, got my MLS, worked in a public library for 12 years, and got to the point where Which one? the next step... Niagara Falls Which Public one? Library. Oh, Niagara Falls. Yes. And got to a point where I didn't want to be the director. So I started looking for other opportunities and I uh, applied at uh, Millard Fillmore Gates Hospital before they were Kaleida and got an interview because the husband of the director knew me from elementary school. <laughs> so <laughs> I had a little bit of an in, but I did interview. I got the job. and. Um, you, like you, you learn as you go. I had a little background as far as um, pharmacy stuff because I worked in my father's drugstore alongside him and learned a lot. But uh, other than that, you learn as you go. Well, that's great. I didn't, I didn't know any of that, Adrian. We need you to didn't. talk more often. <laughs> <laughs> but it just goes to show, like you can have just about any background or lack of background in that regard, um, and still, as long as you're willing to put in the time to learn the resources that are most used by your, your patrons um, and really learn to, to talk the talk because they're gonna come at you with a whole bunch of jargon and terminology. Don't be afraid to ask questions. I think that's one of the things that um, some people have a, uh, they're a little misguided about. They think they have to know all of this information coming in to be a hospital librarian. I think actually more often than not, the physicians and the nurses and the people who come ask questions, if I don't understand something, I just ask them, oh, well, what does that acronym mean? What does this, can you explain that to me a little bit? And they love talking about that mm -hmm. stuff. So um, just you kind of endear yourselves to them by being interested in what they're interested in. And you get a lot of interesting requests and, and form some great relationships that way as well. So um, if anyone on this call is interested in, in uh, pursuing hospital librarianship, but maybe a little daunted by the, the niche subject matter. Um, don't be like, just, just be willing to learn and, and run with it. Plus, we used to have the practicums. We, we had a couple people who actually did them. And then crickets from UB Library School. Um, I don't know why we never got any takers after that. We used to, and I don't think we even advertise anymore unless they have an old um, advertisement up there. We, we could actually resurrect that, but um, 
if you can get a gig with us, if you're interested, you know, we can probably arrange something. Um, although now things are pretty locked down in the hospitals. So um, it's a very different environment than when we started, which here's, a, here's another funny story. Someone asked like the strangest question that you've ever gotten. Um, and what are some interesting questions that you've gotten? So at one of my hospitals, um, this was before 9-11, things were very open. And we used to have people that wandered into the hospital library and we would allow them to use the computers or the facilities. We had a nice big library with uh, study carrels and tables and you know computer room, all these different spaces that you could kind of stretch out and like read the newspaper or whatever. And uh, so this woman came in one day and she was kind of known around the hospital as always being around. And um, she asked for help on the computer and I asked her what she was trying to find. <laughs> she was trying to get a hold of James Brown so she could ask him for money. <laughs> it was like the strangest thing, strangest question. It wasn't library related, but anyway. <laughs> Yeah, we get all, all sorts of requests, not just medical related. And sometimes we have to refer people to other colleagues. We're like, well, we don't have the resources to be able to answer this question. So go to this person. Oh, but but that is a you bring up a good point. I, not all hospital libraries are actually open to the public. They're not open to patients even. Um, it's it's very dependent on, on the location. But um, I know... My, only one of my hospitals is open to patients. Everyone else, you have to have a badge to get in or you have to know the key code to get in the door. Um, and so I know some play, some hospitals have separate separate uh, libraries. They'll have, yeah, they'll have like a patient library with specifically patient or consumer health information. And then they have a medical library, which is specific to with all the expensive textbooks and everything. Um, so if you're at a hospital and you want to know if they have a library that you can go to, like, just ask, ask someone and keep asking until you get an answer. Um, uh, Cause I know that I would love to see patients in my libraries more often, but I just don't think they know that there is a library there that they could go to even. So the question, which we didn't even really address, which was one of our first questions was who do we, whom do we serve? Uh, so we serve um, physicians, nurses, pharmacists, administrators, you know, cleaning people, anyone who needs information. Plus, uh, I know we have computers available in the library um, at my two hospitals, and you do have to have a badge to swipe in, but if not, you could always call. I have had some people call from the community that wanted to come in you know, and use a computer. Um, and uh, what was I say about? Oh, so as far as patients go, I have had nurses or other healthcare professionals call on a patient's behalf um, to either get information. And one time we had a guy come down, uh, he was unexpectedly hospitalized and he was a businessman and he came down with his IV pole to use a computer. <laughs> so that was really a funny story. And uh, you know, we were able to help them out. So that makes you feel good. Yeah. yeah. How about day to day? What do you do day to day in your hospitals? So yeah, this, the main services that we provide are um, literature searches, reference, we answer reference questions. Um, we provide copies of articles, usually in electronic format. Uh, we order interlibrary loans from other institutions. And back in the day, all this stuff, all these uh, processes were done manually. So we had a print union list of serials, or we had what was called BISL, the basic health science library, microfiche, where you could look up uh, journal holdings on that and decide who you wanted to fax this request to. And pretty much a lot of stuff was faxed back, back in the day. And a lot of things are also put in the U.S. mail. Not not so anymore. Um, you know, although it still happens, like we still borrow books from other libraries and we do all of that via mail. It's just much less frequent, maybe a couple of times a year. More often than not, we'll either 
have the book or be able to get them other material that they may need. So we also provide uh, instruction. Um, and this is really difficult because people never have enough time. So you're lucky if you can get someone to come in and spend 15 minutes with you to go over um, you know, the basic resources that they have access to. And um, what's the other thing I was gonna say about what we provide? Oh, we also provide on-site collections, print collections. And my print collection gets used. There's some things that are dusty on the shelf, but one of the big draws in the hospital library are our certification books. So we provide um, ACLS or advanced cardiac life support books, basic life support books, um, pediatric advanced um, life support, and something called the NRP, which is a textbook of neonatal uh, resuscitation. So for these certifications, which almost everybody needs to have at least one or two of them, we have the manuals for them to borrow. And this draws people into the library. And the thing that we hear all the time is, I didn't even know we had a library. I didn't know the hospital had a library. So uh, we're glad to be able to reach um, new customers. And we also have great cat spotting. <laughs> we also have great uh, word of mouth referrals. So that's really the best way to get someone to contact us. A uh, couple of questions from the chat. Caitlin, thanks for a good question. Um, could you talk about some of the resources you utilize in the hospital library? What databases are commonly used? Um, again, this is gonna vary based on what you can afford. So what we do at our hospitals, we actually have um, a library website that we house all of our content on. And so we provide um, access to Medline, which is uh, the standard medical database. Um, we, and that is a free database. Yeah. Um, like through PubMed, you get not only Medline, but there's 20% of their content is other stuff that's pulled from the scientific li literature. Mm -hmm. So you can go into PubMed and do your searches there and also get a lot of free full text through PubMed Central or maybe on a publisher's website or if something is open access. Um, but go ahead, Olivia, continue. No, that's a good point. PubMed is, is available to any and everyone. It's just that the- In the world. In the world, yeah. <laughs> it just may be that the content isn't always available. Um, so that's kind of the, the dividing line, the paywall. Um, and that's another thing. People, <laughs> when it gets down to it, the bottom line is, how do I get access to this article? Well, if you're not going through our portal, you are probably not being authenticated um, to our paid content. Mm -hmm. And again, if there's um, an Olivia, who is our resident evil genius, <laughs> she, I know that's a good designation <laughs> to have. No, she, she's our, our genius. She uh, was totally involved in getting the platform we use, which is Ovid Discovery uh, Service, Ovid D or ODS, and getting that set up for our circuit hospitals since, I don't know if you've ever heard of HubNet, but it, it outgrew its usefulness and was really expensive to update and keep current. And HubNet was, our, our, uh, was an acronym for Hospitals and University, University at Buffalo um, Library Resource Network, which was started back in the 80s, I believe, mm -hmm. and was probably the first consortium in the country in the health sciences to pull their resources for electronic information. Um, the consortium still exists and it's down to, you know, just a few members now because the hospitals have um, merged or disappeared. And um, so now we have a product called Hospital on Library Online. And Olivia does an incredible amount of work in um, maintaining this database, troubleshooting it. I mean, I am amazed by her capabilities. And she was like basically the one in charge of setting it up. Which it's been, uh, technology is wonderful. 
but it also comes with its fair share of hiccups. So it's, um, there are a lot of great things. Someone asked how the, the internet has impacted the medical librarians. Um, and we will circle back to the uh, databases question because there's a lot of other resources that we use. Um, I think the internet has made things so much more accessible to people uh, and allowed consumers, patients, to do the work for themselves and educate themselves more, which is wonderful. But there's also a lot of bad information out there. And so to be able to um, do that critical thinking on your own and say, is this a good source? Is this not a good source? Which is, I think, one, one reason that it's so neat to be in hospital librarianship because we get physicians coming to us. We get nurses, residents coming and they're like, oh, well, I found this on such and such a site, da, da, da. And we want to be like, no, here's a chance for education. Like this, this is not a reputable source. And you need to know this because you're treating patients. You're, you're having people coming through and looking to you, um, to your expertise. <laughs> and uh, you need to know what's a good resource, what's not a good resource. Um, so those are really good teaching moments as well. But um, there's also a lot of other things that technology has, um, I think, it's not been so great, like licensing for e-content. Um, the pricing on e-content is just, uh, we could have a whole separate webinar about that. I mean, it's, re it's really a problem. And I think libraries um, know that uh, and are trying to speak out about it more and more because it's becoming a huger and huger problem. Um, and, and the hospital environment is no uh, exception to that rule. I mean, we, we routinely every year will see um, massive increases, depending on the publisher. I mean, we, we used to, we have one point of care tool um, called up to date. And when it was privately owned, we would routinely see that increase like 20, 30% in one year. Like the hospital bed size hadn't changed that much. The employee bed size hadn't changed that much. It was, it was just astronomical. Um, and, also created by physicians. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so there's, it's, that's a, there's a lot of great things that come with having so much information at your fingertips. Um, but there's also, it brings up a lot of, uh, a lot of conversation points and things. It's, it's that the financial the challenge is one of the big things that we face all the time is how are we going to keep, how are we going to able to sustain what we're, what we're providing? Uh, right. Let me just answer this one question real quick. It says, would you say that the internet has impacted the medical librarians by taking their jobs? Okay, this question, like, that no one's taking our jobs, like, everybody thinks that, you know, everything is available on the internet for free. Uh, try to find it. <laughs> try to get access to it. And, In a uh, legal way, I will say, because yeah. I know some of you guys know about the um, illegal servers for copyrighted content. Please do not get content from those. That's, that is not a good way of getting free content. Go back, okay. go for it. <laughs> I really don't know anything. <laughs> I'm not going to say them because if you don't know about them, I don't want you looking them up. So. Yeah, I, that's not, I, I only go to authoritative sources. So um, can we look at a couple of other yeah. questions that we had? Because I wanted- Let's answer the database one first about oh, what other oh, databases okay. we okay. use real quick. Um, we won't go into too much detail on this, but if you would like to look them up at some other time, you're more than welcome to. So other databases that we use outside of PubMed and Med Medline, which have a pretty large overlap in, in their content. Um, Clinical Key is, is another point of care resource or Clinical Key for nursing is specific to nurses. Um, I know at one of our systems, that one is used a lot. It has a uh, great, great content in there. The searching interface is um, not my favorite, but but the content is really good, um, including electronic books as well mm -hmm. um, and like the top journals. Yeah, um, other overarching databases. Um, Embase is a really good one. Web of Science is another one that includes more than just medical uh, content. Um, both of those do. So, CINAHL, the Cumulative Index for Nursing and Allied Health Literature, that one is a really good one. Um, nursing Reference Center Plus is also good, just that one's primarily for nurses and, and has some great content for nurse managers. That's an EBSCO product and it is a competitor 
uh, with the clinical key for nursing. And it's, it's an excellent product too. Yeah. I miss it sometimes. Yeah. I know Lippincott has its own suite of nursing content as well. Lippincott procedures, Lippincott nursing. We do not have access to those. So I'm not as familiar with those, but I know that the, that there are quite a few people who use that content as well. Um, and there's also a whole slew of pharmaceutical specific databases. LexiComp, I think, is probably one of the ones that's most used. Um, I know that there are others, clinical pharmacology, um, natural medicine for people who are really big with um, supplements and having a database for supplements and that sort of literature. Um, I think that's really all that's coming to my yeah. mind right now. And that that's the database content. Typically you'll have to play it pay um, if you want like a suite of e-journals or a um, collection of e-books, you pay for that content separately. Um, so again, that is a, how much money do you have? How much do you want to spend? Um, but but we, we do get a, a Lippincott total access collection that really does a great job of, of getting a nice array of journals and a lot of them that are very well used. Um, so we, we do like that. Um, Let me just say that in the um, Ovid Discovery platform, uh, basically you, it defaults to a single search box where you put in your keywords and you can search that way and then limit your search if you want to do it in that manner, or you can go directly to a database that you want to search. And I rarely do that. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it depends because there's, there's, um, pluses and minuses. Uh, and this is this, the case for just about any, uh, subject specific database that you're using. Um, there are controlled vocabularies or the SORI. There's, there's going to be terminology that might be very specific to a single database that, um, if you're very familiar with that vocabulary and you want to search very specifically and do a very systematic search, which um, many times I, I do enjoy doing that. I feel like I have more control over my search. I will go into those separate databases and search separately. Um, but sometimes if you're just if you're just getting started with a search, um, I do like to do more of a federated search. So I'll do something very broad across many databases, see what I can get so that I can really mine that vocabulary that I'm looking for and build something that's a little bit more, um, more systematic in what I'm doing. Um, and, and that, again, is going to be dependent on what kind of searcher you are and what kind of uh, how you like to do your, your uh, searching for your users. Um, but they're just to know the pluses and minuses of a federated searching across many databases versus just searching in one. Um, especially in the medical field is, is really important to know because there's some overlap in the databases, but a lot of times you'll get different things from different databases. So you'll need to know where to go to search and, and pull that information that you might need. Each resource kind of has its place. Uh, I regularly use PubMed, which I like a lot. Um, and uh, Actually, you can use Google Scholar if you're looking for, uh, and I'm not you know, pushing Google or anything, but Google Scholar is good for locating known articles yeah. and kind of getting to that kernel of information that you need. Uh, I notice a question here that says anything specific to NPs? I'm not exactly sure where that's going, but uh, they're considered medical uh, staff. So you know, naturally there's gonna be articles that have to do with nurse practitioners um, within our databases. And CINAHL, we get a lot of MPs that look for information in, in CINAHL. Um, Nursing Reference Center Plus, I know that they'll have some information in there as well. Uh, Nursing Reference Center Plus has really cool skill sheets that they, they'll have like checklists and techniques and things that they parse it out really um, step-by-step step really well. Uh, and I know a lot of MPs use use those just to as refreshers for different different skills that they want to brush up on. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. I want to jump in here to our list of questions that were submitted ahead of time. There's some good ones in here that can be answered quickly. Number two, are, are librarians versed in HIPAA regulations? <laughs> we should be. <laughs> 
that's important. That's yes, really we important. are. <laughs> We're always retrieving uh, confidential information from that is left in our printers and putting it in the secure recycling. So we're we're well aware of privacy. Mm -hmm. um, this one is from our friend down at uh, our friend Annette Cubby Williams, who's down at Vanderbilt, who is kind of like the leading uh, academic um, health sciences library, I believe, in the U.S. Um, they're they're really high echelon. And she said, do you provide education classes, materials regarding study design, research processes, et cetera? So uh, we've taken these classes. We understand some of the concepts, but that would be something that we would um, refer people to maybe to UB, uh, the UB Health Sciences Library, because that's not something that we're experts in. Um, we will do overviews for things. I do many one-on-one -on -one sessions, especially with residents who are just beginning to do, they have a capstone research project that they have to do in their final year. And so, um, you know, identifying what, what is this study design? Is it an observational study? Is it a clinical trial? Is it a cohort study? Doing that sort of surface, um, teaching I think is pretty common, um, but to get a really good grasp, um, we just don't have the time. Um, I, I wish we did, maybe one day we will, I don't know. But. Here's another question from Vanderbilt. Um, can the library service provide evidence for more in-depth questions? For example, some hospital departments are interested in updating their uh, nursing pathways clinical order sets. Is that work that can be taken on by the circuit librarian? And the answer is yes. <laughs> so what yeah. usually happens is we're given their um, a list of references that need to be updated um, every year and are looked at by joint commission. And so these are always a challenge, mm -hmm. um, but I actually enjoy it because it gets me more familiar with the literature. So, so we do that sort of thing, mm -hmm. just to answer the question. And Mary Jo had made a really good point um, about a lot of hospital librarians being, being solo librarians. So we wear a lot of different hats, do a lot of different things, never have enough time um, to do all the things that we would like to do, but it's really neat to be able to dabble in a whole bunch of different um, different areas, doing a little bit of teaching, collection development, policy, reformatting, um, all, all sorts of different things. It really is a, a job that you, you get to see and meet a lot of different people and just have to roll with the punches a lot of times. Um, and I agree with your comment, Mary Jo, about clinical key for nursing versus nursing reference center. We had battles <laughs> about this for different hospitals in our region because um, yeah, some people don't wanna pay the bill and uh, they're, they're uh, sold by different vendors, Elsevier versus EBSCO. Um, and so there's a lot of different opinions on this. And uh, just suffice it to say, we had one system that went one way, we have another hospital that went another way. Um, and it's really gonna be what, what the people are more comfortable with. You mentioned educators, yep. That's typically who gets to make that call. Yeah, we, um, we don't make that decision. Yeah. Um, that is uh, something that the hospitals can hash out yeah. uh, within their system. We do try to just provide them with the information about both resources that they need and, and say, you know, here are the pros and cons to this one. Here are the pros and cons to this one. There's usually a period of a trial where they'll get to mess around with it and see if they like one better than the other. Um, and then they get to make that call and um, open up their checkbooks if they want to go in a way that we can't fund fully. So yeah, I, I know what that battle is. <laughs> Here's another very important question that I want to cover before we close. Um, how do you prove that you're important to your stakeholders? And what is the metric in the hospital library? Olivia, do you want to? Um, honestly, like I know so many people will say that um, you have to prove your worth with a dollar amount. And it's really difficult to do that in a library setting. 
Um, so really we, I think for me, it's making those relationships with people and um, getting them to be your champion and just having in your, in your back pocket, those instances of um, knowing that you've helped them do something and that they're willing to talk about it to other people. Um, and I, I know that that is, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it's really, it's huge. I've had people um, really go to bat for me at different hospitals because I've helped them with one massive project that they were doing. Um, and they saw the worth of the library and what, what we do as librarians and, and they'll, they'll fight tooth and nail for you. Um, I know that there's also one thing that I really am appreciative of is in residency programs, they, the hospitals that have these residency programs need to be accredited by uh, a separate body, uh, organizational body. And in their guidelines for the hospitals to be accredited, they have to um, have a library. They have to have electronic resources because these residents are still learning and it's so important for them to have those resources. So ACGME or graduate medical education. Right, values. right. So having those accrediting bodies that really uh, value the uh, and require those electronic resources or having um, librarians, they don't technically say librarians, um, but they'll say electronic resources to further the education of residents um, is really important. And so it's nice to nice to have that. So you, you can have, you know, the, the Joint Commission um, requirements, which are not much anymore. There used to be way more substantial things um, that were listed um, under information management. Basically now you need to have access to electronic resources. So that's pretty vague. Um, something that we put in our cover letter to um, our administrators is um, we make a couple of points about where, where we really stand out and why we're important. And the four areas are, number one, cultivating an evidence-based mindset. Okay, within your culture. So I'll just quickly go through these. Librarians reinforce a culture of excellence and equalize information access and training to support better care, better patient care outcomes. Never thought of that. Number two, mitigating risk. So librarians support to cl clinician and patient care teams uh, ensure customized, on-demand, timely, and efficient access to the right information, saving time and money, reducing exposure to hospital and physician malpractice, lawsuits, and adverse events. Number three, competitive advantage. Um, Hospital-wide access to an on-site medical librarian involvement in committees is a visible sign of the hospital's commitment to progressive care. So if you're trying to recruit physicians and you don't have a hospital library or a service, you're not gonna get the top people because all of the best people use the library. <laughs> and that's, that's true. That's not just you know baloney or lip service. Um, and the last thing we mention in our cover letter is leading change and future planning. So that includes orientations, for residents and new hires and the, as part of the onboarding process. And um, here's kind of a good statement. Librarians assist administrators by locating information that identifies benchmarks, best practices for better healthcare outcomes. We support best workplace initiatives and increase reimbursement strategies. And we do get questions from our administrators. So what other, what else do we have? We have like four minutes left. Uh, oh, okay. Free training through NLLM is. Yeah, there's a lot of um, the consumer health information specialization in NLM, the Nat network for the National Library of Medicine, which Grace had mentioned earlier. Um, they have a lot of free training for any number of things. Um, and if anyone is inter interested specifically in consumer health information, they have a specialization um, that familiarizes you with a lot of resources, and they also target certain populations and say how to address consumer health information in those different populations. Uh, and so there's, 
really, really good information out there and it's free. And there's a lot of on-demand courses too. You can go back and do them at any time. Um, so I definitely recommend checking them out. They've got, they're very helpful, very kind, and a lot of really good information. I wanna speak real quick to something Mary Jo mentioned. Absolutely, we help um, nurses who are going back to school, maybe re-entering uh, the educational realm after years of being gone. Uh, we help them adjust to that process. And there's, there's really no more associate degrees um, as far as like nursing goes. You've got to have a bachelor's degree. The, the people with bachelor's degrees are encouraged to get their master's or even go even further. So these people are working full time in healthcare. And a lot of times it's easier for them to come to us for help. Um, in locating articles or getting some search training. Also to the, um, the library, the electronic library access that we provide, they can access this information from home as well. So they just need to set up an account and uh, that's another thing that's provided for them. And then, um, yeah, thanks for reminding me, Caitlin, about the telehealth project. So even though um, we, spent most of the time today talking about hospital libraries. That was the whole point. Um, Grace and I are also involved in a lot of other things through the council as well. And so one thing that um, I've been working on with another council colleague, her name's Heidi Ziemer, is uh, the Telehealth and Libraries Initiative. And um, we've partnered with two libraries here in Western New York, one in a rural area and one in an underserved urban area um, and have, provided them with a pod, um, just as a space that is sound dampened and they can have uh, telehealth appointments in there. Uh, so a secure Wi-Fi connection, a private space, um, really trying to bridge that uh, digital divide for a lot of people who may not have Wi-Fi at home or internet at home, or may not have a device to access that, may not know how to do it, but um, we will have dedicated staff at those locations to uh, help walk people through that process. Um, and so we're, we're trying to bring that, that health know-how, that, that information to the public, because we think it's so important um, that the public is aware of what resources are out there and that they, they can know that they can go to their library to get um, that information that someone will be able to help them. So uh, if you don't have some sort of telehealth initiative in your region, maybe uh, take that idea back so you can get something started. Uh, we'd love to see it grow here in Western New York. Very quickly, mm -hmm. uh, in talking about preparing for hospital librarianship, there is a book, and this has probably since been updated, that um, was published in cooperation with the MLA or the Medical Librarian Association. This one's on health sciences librarianship. So you can find information in print if you wanna get a, an overview of what's involved with that. Uh, and someone had asked here about um, getting a copy of these four things that I mentioned as far as like, to, like a script to convince administrators that this is why we're needed. I, I can send that out, that little section to you, yeah. yes. Okay. Um, and I will also say, sorry, this is back to the telehealth thing. Um, there, we have one pod that is actually staffed by a social worker. She is in her final year, I believe. Um, and so can not only help people find the information that they need health wise, but also connect them with other community organizations um, in that area. And so that's been a really big benefit to the program down at that, that rural library to have this uh, dedicated person to help everyone who comes through that space. So, sorry, Seth. So you can, you can um, contact us through the LibGuide link or just from the Winnie Lurk website if you wanna you know, send back any feedback or anything like that. And we're always happy to answer questions yeah. that you might have. Um, feel free to call upon us. We do this all the time, mm -hmm. so. Um, we are here to help. <laughs> that, that is like the bottom line. So anyway, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the program and uh, yeah, learn something new about hospital libraries. <laughs> Take care. Thank you, Grace and Olivia.
I just want to briefly mention that I will be sending out an email um, later today with the evaluation. So please fill that out. I will also have instructions for accessing your CE certificate. Um, and we will send the recording out sometime next week. Thank you all for attending and participating. I hope you enjoy the webinar and that you learn what you came here to learn about hospital libraries. Thank have a nice you. day. Stay everyone. safe.